thank you so much, everybody. And it's great to be here with Marin Alsap, who is really a true pioneer in the classical music world. When we met a few years ago, I remember I went to Lucerne in Switzerland to see her conduct. And I crunched a few numbers at the time just to see what was going on with women on the podium. And what I learned was women were more likely to be four-star officers in the United States military. They were more likely to lead G7 industrialized nations than they were to lead major American orchestras. And that is still true even after Theresa May left Britain as prime minister. <laughs> so I'm wondering, how did you forge this path and how did you overcome the obstacles that were in your way when you wanted to become a conductor? And what set you off in the beginning wanting to be a conductor? Okay, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, uh, I was born, um, my parents were both professional musicians, so I mean, I had no choice and they needed a pianist, so that's why I was born. <laughs> and, um, but I hated the piano and uh, they tricked me when I was six years old into changing careers to the violin and that's an for another story, but the great thing about playing the violin was I got to sit in an orchestra and I love the sound of the orchestra. And uh, then I got in trouble playing in the orchestra because I was, <coughs> I was moving around too much and having too much fun, you know, and this classical music thing, by the way, is really a button down elite uh, experience that doesn't really agree with my personality. So um, <coughs> luckily my dad took me to a concert and the conductor came out and he wasn't wearing a tuxedo, he was wearing like a turtleneck and he, he was so groovy and he turned around and he started talking to me. I mean, to the audience, and I thought he was talking to me and explaining the piece and I said, oh, I, I wanna be this guy. I wanna be, it, the conductor was Leonard Bernstein. And I said, <laughs> that's who I wanna be. And I never changed my mind, I was nine years old and I told my violin teacher I was really happy I had already selected my career change and <laughs> She said, you know, you're too young and girls don't do that. And I thought, okay, one of those is okay, but it's going to change, but I'm going to run into some problems. And, you know, so <clears throat> that was the first time, though, I had ever heard this concept that girls couldn't do something. You know, my parents were just, my mother played the cello. My father carried it. You know, I thought this was a great arrangement. She played the big instrument and he carried it. I, this is how I thought life worked. But and, and so how did you elbow your way into this career that you wanted? Well, you know, it's, it took a long time, obviously. Um, and I auditioned for schools. The thing about conducting, listen, you, you probably don't care, care that much about classical music, but I want you to care. Um, and I, I, or about conducting. Um, <laughs> please, I need you to care. Um, but it, classical music has done a terrible job of, of enabling people to care because they've pushed everybody out and they've made it elitist and that's not at all what it is. But anyway, the, um, you know, I, I really, I wanted to, I, the thing about conducting is you can't practice. Okay, violin I could practice because I can carry my violin around and practice. I have to carry 40 people around to, can, <laughs> to practice conducting. So you can't try it out anywhere. So, you know, my friends would all, they would see my number and, you know, hang up the phone because everybody was, oh, no, don't answer because she wants you to come and play a symphony over at her apartment. <laughs> and, but that's what I would do. I would get people together. And the thing about um, trying to work as a woman, especially 30 years ago, 35 years ago, is that there were no opportunities to even try to practice your instrument. So this was a, a huge challenge. And... I couldn't, I tried to audition for school and I got pretty far considering I'd never really conducted. But finally I realized the only way to become a conductor was to f get all my friends together and create an orchestra. So that's what I did here in uh, Manhattan and uh, I had that orchestra. And you know, the great thing was that I found a mentor, also a non-musical mentor, a gentleman named Tomi Otaki who owned Ann Klein Clothing, and um, he started Donna Caron in her um, career, and I met him at his wedding. I played, I had a swing band also, by the way, on the side. But um, <laughs> I met him, and I said, Mr. Taki, um, I know you don't know me at all, but uh, I, I wanna start an orchestra. The only thing I wanna be is a conductor, and would you help me? And he said, well, I don't really like classical music, but sure, I'll help you. <laughs> and for 18 years, he supported my orchestra, and, uh, 
he's an amazing guy. So without him, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But I, that's that's how I got started. It was you know I had this self self um, start and and really it was like a vanity orchestra a little bit of course because uh, you know I, I, it was the only way I could figure out. But I was surrounded by friends and I think you know if you really enable your friends to give you constructive criticism, it's so I empowering and it really really is helpful. Now, since then, you've gone on to major orchestras around the world. You're, you're the music director of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. You lead the Sao Paulo Orchestra in Brazil. You're about to take over the Vienna Radio Symphony Orchestra next year. But what's interesting to me is that in most fields, like in politics or in business or in media, you know, there are, are what we come to recognize as sort of coded attacks on women, coded gendered attacks on women, and we know what they mean. But since I came to cover classical music, I was really sort of stunned by the extent to which some old line maestros in the last three, four, or five years feel completely empowered to make non-coded attacks. Yeah, they don't you need know. a code. I mean, these are some of the things that like working conductors have said about women on the podium in recent years. A sweet girl on the podium can make one's thoughts drift towards something else. For me, seeing a woman on the podium, well, let's just say it's not my cup of tea. There was a famous conducting teacher who said that women should stick to feminine repertoire like Debussy. And not that long ago, in your predecessor in Baltimore, a Russian maestro, Yuri Temurkanov, returned to your orchestra in your hometown. No, I think this quote actually w happened as he's, he was sitting in my dressing room. Right. And he gave an interview to the Baltimore Sun, and he said, yes, women can be conductors. I am not against them conducting, but I simply don't like it. So how do you deal with that I think world? He, I think he also said, it's, it's like fish. I don't like fish either. Right. right. And, and so how do, you, how do you change the conversation? Seriously, I mean, what can you say? The, the, I, think, I think there's so many, I mean, you know, the, the great thing about the last two years is that we, I feel empowered to speak out even further. I've always felt. I've always felt empowered for some reason to speak out, but now I feel at least I have company mm -hmm. and that there's a safety net. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I try to take the position that I, I, have, I have some compassion for people who don't think before they speak. So that's what I try to think. <laughs> and, you know what happened when, when I, I, you know, I've been the first woman to do a lot of things. I mean, it's, it, it's sort of, I'm very proud and I also think it's absolutely pathetic that we can be in the 21st century and have first for women still, it's ridiculous. But when I was the first woman to conduct at the last night of the proms in London, um, a young conductor, also a colleague of mine, uh, Petrenko, came out and said, I think one of those quotes is from him. So. He emailed me and said, oh, you know, I, they misquoted me. So I, I actually phoned him up and I said, I started in 2002, I started a fellowship for women conductors. I, I call it the Taki, after Mr. Taki, Taki Concordia, Concordia was our orchestra fellowship because, you know, I wanted to say thank you back to him and I also wanted to create opportunities for young women. And um, so I called Mr. Petrenko Maestro Petrenko, and I said, you know, you really need to um, uh, mentor one of my young women <laughs> fellows. And so this is my attitude, is that if you're gonna step out and say things like that, I'm gonna get you. So, so that's, that's it, everything's an opportunity, mm -hmm. I try. But it, it's true, it's a very, it's a very, you know, there's dust over this whole industry. And, and everyone seems immune in classical music. Well, maybe not anymore, and now that you're here. <laughs> and it was interesting, you know, watching you lead a coaching session for young women in Switzerland once, and I was struck by the extent to which you weren't even showing, you know, beat patterns or how you communicate with the orchestra, but you were also sort of giving them advice how to make it as a female conductor, what they should do and not do. What, what are the things you try to tell people? Well, the, the thing about conducting is that it's all body language. So, <clears throat> you know, our society interprets um, gesture very differently from men or from women. So I, I try to give you an example. You know when, you, well, I, 
in conducting, if, if, I'm, if, if a conductor as a woman is doing something very delicate, you know, that's considered kind of weak. But if a man does that, it's sensitive. And, you know, sort of the flip side of that is, for me, the, the most challenging gesture was to get a huge sound from the brass. They're usually the big guys in the orchestra, you know, really. And there's a way to get that sound and try not to be called the B word. You know what I mean? So that you want to you wanna get that out of everybody but you don't want to have any kind of association with that. So I'm, I'm willing to, but I talk to my male students the same way though about it too, that, but for women, I think we, we're required to, at least as conductors, to think twice about gesture because it's not just the gesture, it's also how the musicians interpret the gesture because it's different for women. And you know, when you came to Baltimore, you know, it was a rocky beginning your appointment was announced and there was all this sort of unseemly grumbling in the press and so you came with... It wasn't issue. in the press, it was from the musicians. From the musicians, yeah, which made it into the press. So you got there and you immediately started some really unique initiatives. Talk a little bit about coming into that situation and how you work to turn things around and also some of the things you've done there which are really kind of unique in the orchestral world. Well, it, um, in, in the United States there are only 15 major professional orchestras, full-time professional orchestras, and Baltimore is number 15 on the list, you know, in terms of budget size and, and resources. Um, when I was appointed, there was an enormous pushback for many, many reasons, a lot, a lot of which had nothing to do with me, but, um, you know, I was, I was, I had this dilemma, should I take this job? Everybody was advising me, don't go there, don't take this job, and I thought, well, you know, the first woman to be appointed and then, you know, she chickens out. I, I just couldn't do that. So I, I went there and I, I went there with the goal of creating um, a culture of joy and success for the musicians. And it was very liberating actually because nobody liked me. So I didn't have to waste time, you know, <laughs> making friends and being liked. I just went in and I said, okay, ma, I just, let's do this, let's make it happen, let's do. And so, um, and one of the things for me is um, uh, not just gender diversity, but also our orchestras do not reflect our communities. Baltimore is 70% African American. We have one African American player in the orchestra. Why is that? Because the kids don't have the same opportunities depending on your economic um, situation. So I started a program um, an after-school program with 30 kids in 2008. We call it um, Orchids, Orchestra Kids. And um, we now have 1,500 kids playing musical instruments. And they're amazing. They're incredible. Yeah. It's an amazing program. And I went Michael's last come year down to and, see them. You know, it's really in some of Baltimore's absolutely poorest neighborhoods. And you know, there's a free dinner at the end. But they're going to change the face of classical music. And uh, what I want to tell you is that they love classical music. And it's, it's a haven for them and a refuge and a way to be themselves and, and see possibility. And I think it is important, you know, being a role model, you know, we talk about that a lot. There are, certainly are a bunch of prominent women conductors now finally following in your footsteps. There's been some movement in the last five or six years particularly. But what have you learned about being a role model through the ORCHIDS program? Oh, well, gosh, um, I had a, there's a great story, if you don't mind me telling that, um, I went to see the little ones um, do a, little, a concert and I was sitting and next to me was a little girl, maybe nine years old and, and a little boy sitting next to her. And he leaned over and he said, oh, Miss Marin, that they call me Miss Marin. Miss Marin, I wanna be a conductor. And the little girl between us slapped him on the leg and said, boys can't do that. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my work here is done. <laughs> No, of course, I said, of course, Kevin, you can be a conductor. I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> good, good. Well, thank you.